He's an astute New Zealander, which you'll get the sense of that in this interview, with an unwavering passion for leveraging disruptive technology and creative ideas to improve a brand's human experience. He's based in Sydney. His business is called AF Digital, and he's a Salesforce Platinum Consulting Partner. He operates across APAC, and he provides consulting and managed services into the Salesforce ecosystem. He's brilliant at what he does. Robin Leonard from afdigital.com. I think you're doing a marvellous job in changing the way that you go to market and what clients you love to work with and what problems you love to solve for them. We're a Salesforce partner. We generally model ourselves into industries. We really focus on retail and consumer goods, financial services, non-profit, travel and tourism, and we do other industries. Generally, we're looking for mid-sized clients. It's really the size of business that can afford to work with partners on an ongoing basis is really our target. And generally, the best kind of clients are the ones that have a clear board direction and investment into a digital transformation play. We work with a lot of clients that dip their toe in the water and those are good clients but the best clients are the ones that have made a very conscious decision to go forth into this world of salesforce and adopt it properly with those different industry verticals did you start in a particular one and then add or have you been across them and tell us a little bit about how you prioritize the verticals yeah, it's really hard to be honest, Paul. Like, I love all of the industries. It's been opportunistic over the years. We've always been very strong in retail. Yeah. We have been a marketing focused Salesforce partner for a long time and retail is a really great place for that to happen and travel as well we did a lot of airlines and had clients like Qantas for many years so we really fell into those but through those experiences we built out our expertise at the end of the day you look at the sum of work you've done and that's how we define what our focus is now we're taking that bottom up information and focusing on those industries and building out clear stories and solutions that fit say the insurance sector specifically or the retail industry what are some of the biggest problems are you helping them solve when you go into a digital transformation a lot of companies are buying salesforce and not adopting it correctly you've got a technology investment and we're here to help fit it to your business and make sure your business adopt it correctly and it works for you that's a problem in itself is buying technology and not using it correctly companies throw a lot of money out the door every year on shelfware or really expensive technology that they're using and they could have a cheaper tool that just does that one thing they need it to do that adoption process is a big part of what we do the general challenge that a lot of organizations have is their profitability. As we grow our revenues, often our variable costs grow as well. Companies have to hire more staff and then you get into these bubbles like we're seeing in the tech sector where they've hired too many staff and they're like, actually, we don't need that many staff. We want more profit. And yes. that's where they lay people off. What we really focus on is helping our clients use Salesforce to increase the revenue through things like marketing automation and automating the sales process and decrease the cost of the business operation. Having chatbots instead of having people answering phone calls, you're able to squeeze both sides and that EBIT is really the driving factor behind everything that we do. The problem that we face is a lot of companies don't yet see that as the objective. They're just really yeah. struggling to make Salesforce work for them. They're there's forces that will drive the decisions that are not bottom up. The board needing to reduce cost, they're forced to find ways to automate those processes or scale them so they're not so people dependent. For example, I've got a Din Tai Fung below me and they've got a robot waiter. Yes. It's not super efficient, but it does three shifts in a day, never complains, never takes leave. It maybe costs them $100,000 to buy initially, yes. but th then they don't have to pay anything for salary ongoing. It's obvious to see that if you have a few robots that over maybe one to two years, they'll pay for themselves for that initial investment, but then they're ultimately scalable. Yes. So that's really the value equation. Once boards grapple their head around that, the cost is so dramatic for salaries that it will force that change to happen. Yeah. I think that there is a bad rap and there's a balance with automation as well because automation also creates technical debt. So if I set up a RPA, RPA is a robotic process automation. It's becoming more prevalent now where side by side, you train a robot to perform a task on your computer. Yeah. That's actually starting to create technical debt where a lot of automations have been set up and it does the job 
job, yes. but unpicking it and really making it a robust integration with a, a platform automation. That is the next step. So you get all this technical debt where it's like, oh, we've set up too many bots doing too many things. We don't know how to unpick it. So there is a balance of doing a strategic automation versus doing a kind of hack automation. From the end consumer point of view, I go to the bot and then I go to the bot and it's just so frustrating. But how far away are we where it's actually more pleasant. Large organizations actually have a really big issue with automating and changing the automations because they're tied to legacy technology. They've got these big databases, they've got on-premise systems, they've got added security controls. So actually iterating a really great chatbot experience is a lot harder for them than say it would be for a smaller business with less technical constraint. That's one consideration. In these large organizations, it's difficult for them. And to an extent, it allows disruption and startups, which is a really great thing. This technology yeah. disruption curve is really going to allow for new businesses like neobanks to just get started. One of our clients is a home loan neobank and they've got an app. You don't have to deal with the bank. They don't have the overheads of everything and they've got a very lightweight architecture. It's where the banks want to be, but they just can't be because they've got this old mainframe technology. Take us through the journey of how you've actually changed your business model to what it is today. Acknowledging it's really hard to run a Salesforce consulting business or any consulting business because you've got fixed payroll. We're not perfect. Everyone's on a journey. Where we started was doing quick start implementations, one-time accelerators. We would get people live on Salesforce and then hope that we'd do a next project. It was really great because we had a lot of acquisition. We had a great price model. It was really quick and easy for customers and account executives from Salesforce to refer. The challenge was there wasn't really a plan for after the first project. The clients, because they were buying in at a small price, it was literally just the toe in the water. It wasn't a very strategic decision. We actually started doing larger projects where, okay, you want to deal with us. It's X dollars. This is how long it's going to take and really properly building a project with a budget. What we've shifted to is actually a managed service program. We've been running this managed service program for years. Now it's front and center. One of the key reasons we're doing it is the IFRS which is the international financial tax regulation. They clarify one of the clauses around tax for professional services around cloud consulting. Because cloud, you're renting the software, you're subscribing to it, you don't own the IP and the cloud technology. It's not considered an asset that you own as a company obviously. Yes. So therefore, any work that you pay a consultant to do on that project, it should be considered OPEX, not CAPEX, because you're not yes. creating any asset. Even though you could argue we're creating a data asset, and in some cases you're putting code in and that is an asset. Generally, we're configuring a subscription service. Companies haven't necessarily changed how they do this, and they're still throwing down their CAPEX on big projects of work. The reality of where it has to move to is considering it OPEX. So if I yeah. have a consultant billing me for work, I've got to take that cost out of somewhere else, either have a headcount open or it's going to hit my Q1 profitability. Just because I had a big project in Q1, that's why we're not profitable. Are the shareholders going to accept that? We're a subscription service, Salesforce partner. And I think we're the first partner that has come to market like that as a subscription, where you subscribe to our business and our team. We've got consultants across APAC. They're multi-talented. They augment your team in terms of adopting Salesforce correctly and getting value. It comes with all of the services you generally need from a Salesforce partner. We started as a marketing cloud specialist. Now we're a multi-cloud partner. We're a MuleSoft partner. We're a .org partner. We can generally support most clients. We've got an ecosystem of alliances. I've got other specialist partners that will refer in. We can subcontract, but you come to us as your GP. OPEX is operating expenditure and CAPEX is capital expenditure, right? You've got your assets in your business that you write off over time, that's capital. And then you've got your expenses, which expense at the time. This is a really brilliant model. We used to back in corporate always have the discussion of yes it's capital but let's all the training was operating expenditure opex right so we used to try to put the training in but then we wouldn't have any money left so they'd say look we won't put any training in and then we'll find the money and then obviously you never found the money and then the system never got implemented i think it's a really smart way of leveraging the accounting system to your advantage but also leveling out the cost to the client, which is brilliant. I think it's a great model. Do you ever get in the discussion how you haven't done as much work this month, but you're still charging me this amount of money. You get the people in procurement and we've all come across them where they're like, I want to know by item exactly what you're doing every second of the day. That's their job to do that. And then you come in with a service where you get 
all you can eat for this price. Absolutely, Paul. It's actually very common, especially in enterprise. You can't solve it is the yeah. short answer. We realize that some clients can't love it. They yeah. want it, but they're like, look, our procurement says I've got to have deliverables. I've got to have milestones. I've got to have milestone yeah. payments. Those kind of things you can't get around because procurement's quite hard. Yes. So you just have to be flexible. You've got to do a bit of everything. We still do traditional projects. We do those quick start packages. I talk about customer lifetime value with our clients. You've got a funnel and every lead you get in, you convert. There's value in that lead if you know your conversion rate and if you know your customer lifetime value. We know our customer lifetime value. So every time there's an opportunity created in our sales force, even if it's not qualified, I know that's like worth thousands of dollars. I know yes. that a certain percentage will convert. As far as the managed service fee, do you have 50 versions of it for all different clients or have you got it more streamlined that there's three versions of the managed service fee? We started with multiple versions. What we've actually resolved to is going to one product where it's just Team X and it's a yes. base that you build on and we tailor it for yeah. our clients and it's like a loyalty program. If you sign up to a certain threshold of monthly spend, then you get a higher discount. Or if you sign up for a longer period, you get a higher discount. So we just tailor it one-to-one -one based on the needs of the customer. What happens if clients don't spend their budget? It's a problem when it's a support desk only. If it's inbound and the client's driving the backlog, then you don't spend it and they do become a bit frustrated. The actual solution to that problem is not just to provide support, it's to provide strategic services as well. We've got this framework around customer lifetime value and we take our clients through that and that builds a three-year roadmap very easily. We've got a backlog of more than enough work than anyone has to do. Salesforce is so cookie cutter. It's like 101, this is my first CRM. If you want to do any function, there's an obvious answer on which part of Salesforce to use for that. Or maybe Salesforce can't and you have a ISV selection. It's very easy for us to plan this out for the clients. Clients don't know what's going on. It's their first cloud CRM. For us, it's just a straightforward method to get to the end stage, which is full self-service, full automation, sales automation with sales people that can scale their sales and have unlimited sales, service reps that only deal with the high value customers and the really big issues, all of the other nonsense, the administrative work that should be automated. If you're looking to sell this business at some point, obviously having a lot more guaranteed income stream, it's a lot easier to get a multiple on that. So I'm assuming that's going to be a benefit. And then the other is from a cash flow point of view working out where you're going to spend your money in the future, it's a lot easier under this model. What we're seeing from an M&A perspective is there's a higher multiplier given to recurring revenue businesses. I think that's fairly obvious. From a cash flow perspective, it's actually a pro and a con. As you're shifting your revenue into recurring, you have to forfeit a large project in a quarter into revenue over 12 months. Yes. So that actually is an impact and you've got to balance that shift of revenue. It's not necessarily about the valuation, it's about the stability of the business. It's the yes. financial backbone. That allows us to have confidence with our employees. Salesforce have this model as well. They do talk about having 80% of their revenue forward book. And we've got the same idea is that we just want to forward book everything for the next few years. We can see our revenue in advance and it just makes our decision making so much easier. Can we afford to get a new employee or do we have too many employees? Is there any iterations you're thinking of doing given what you've learned so far? I've got so many ideas. It's about thinking about it from our customer's perspective. Yeah. If I think about our customer, the internal people in the organization are very different. You've got the marketing side of the business and you've got the technology side are usually the two big ones we deal with. They've got very different operating methods. The IT guys, they deal with technology like a CFO deals with money. It's control and governance. It can't go down. It's production supported. So they've got all of these restrictions and their agility and how they do digital transformation. Yes. The marketing guys, they need the technology to work for them to deliver more value and do their actual jobs. They need to work closely with the IT guys and there's just this constant fight between them. That's where we bridge the gap and help them work together. It's definitely not easy. But depending on the role I'm playing in the transformation, I have a very different view of the world. Yes. I'm the BA on the client side on the project versus the PM on the client side. That's two different bits of information that I need to be aware of. If I'm the CMO versus the CIO, if I'm the IT manager that has to adopt this new Salesforce into my ITSM process and have ITIL around it and raise tickets to partners, that's a lot of change of how they work. If I were to have an app, my Salesforce transformation app, yes. what would that look like for each of those humans? What 
would it give me? How would it nudge me? Hey, Robin, you haven't completed your user stories yet for the product that you own. You need to do that. Do you want to know how to write a user story? Imagine ChatGPT tied with that. Right now, the problem with transformations is the IT manager, he's upset with his job, his wife left him, he's got sleep issues, he comes to work, he's just trying to get his job done. Someone's forcing new things down his face. You've got to go on this training course, you've got to be excited about this. If you're not excited, maybe you should leave. This poor guy, how do we make it more empathetic to him to go through that process where he doesn't have the fear of job loss, he doesn't have that discouraging feeling of failure when you don't get it right the first time. All of those humans need to go through that path. Yes. As a Salesforce partner, how do I touch those people in the right way? And right now it's very manual. We have a buddy system where we try and tie up a person on our side with a person on their side to coach and mentor them because yes. it's so emotional and it's so perception based. What is the perception of success for you. A lot of people will think it's failed even if it's been awesome because they've never gone through it before. That was hard. We should never do that again. No, that was really good. You should see what other people do. I love the fact that you're bringing that into your model because ultimately it's all about change, right? The system part of it's normally the easy bit. It's the people and the, the, the people side of it, which is hard. What are some of the daily sales habits that uh, you do to help you to accelerate AF digital? Templates. Tech sales is super complex and difficult. So templating it and making it easy. Where do you go and your team goes to find more about sales and how to do sales? Selling is consultative approach. So mm -hmm. if you learn more about the product and the best practices, go through the Salesforce certs, that actually makes you a stronger salesperson. Outside of that, I go to Salesforce. They've got a lot of partner material for any Salesforce partners. If we could grant you one wish for AF Digital, what would that be? Oh, Paul, I just wish money didn't matter and we could just help clients freely. Their budget limitations is a limitation for us as well. And also for us, we've got to make money. I wish we could just do it for free because I'd absolutely love doing it. What do you know now that you wish you had to learn earlier? The best salespeople are the delivery people, enabling our actual delivery team to sell to our clients and grow the accounts. That's the key. Robin, it's been an absolute joy listening to the changes. And I love the fact that you're humble in the way that it hasn't all gone to plan. But I think if you step back and look holistically, I think it's something that you watching this or listening to this could go and experiment with and learn a lot from what Robin's shared today.